thank you for joining us for today's seminar. You will not be ticked about today's speakers, Dr. Sam Telford. Dr. Telford's work crosses ecologic scales to study vector-borne infections, especially tick-borne diseases through fieldwork, lab methods, and epidemiological techniques. Dr. Telford earned his bachelor's in ecology and evolution at Johns Hopkins, and then a master's in tropical public health, and a doctor of science in parasitology at Harvard School of Public Health, followed by a postdoc post studying Lyme disease at Harvard. Since then, he has been at the School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University, where he's a professor in the Department of Infectious Disease and Global Health, and the director of the New England Regional Biosafety Lab. His research, in short, centers around tick and mosquito-borne diseases, characterizing their epidemiology and ecology in the environment. He has made many tremendous discoveries and contributions to our understanding of Boston and deer tick virus, Lyme disease, and other important tick disease ecology in the Northeast. And today, he will be giving us a taste of his work on Lyme disease epidemiology and control. We eagerly anticipate his presentation and the valuable insights he'll share with us today. So without further ado, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Sam Telford. I, I understand that it, it's customary for someone to, to sort of give you an idea of, of how I came to be where I am today. So I, I grew up, uh, my, my, my father was a parasitologist for the World Health Organization, and he worked on, you know, his, his main interest, he was a herpetologist interested in the parasites of reptiles, and you can't get funding for that. Uh, but uh, uh, he also got good training as a general zoologist, including mammalogy. And so he 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 worked at the uh, uh, got a postdoc in Japan, working on the the ecology of, of field lizards and on 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 the the, the, the Ryukyu Island pit vipers. Went to Panama to the Gorgas Memorial Laboratory. We worked on the ecology of Leishmaniasis. Uh, and that's where I started. He would take me to the field, the jungle. And I would remember, you know, he and his men carrying big stacks of tomahawk traps on his shoulders, walking into the jungle, setting these and 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 uh, catching uh, spiny rats and, and having his men climb trees and, 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 and shake sloths down to the ground. And, and he ended up with a paper in science on the call of the Reservoir of Leishmania panamensis, which is, was the sloth, moved from there a, a little, a uh, couple years at the University of Florida, and went to Venezuela, ecology of Chagas disease, Pakistan, ecology of scrub typhus, uh, uh, Tanzania, ecology of plague, Burma, ecology of plague, and everywhere where he went, he fostered my interest in zoology, and in particular in herpetology. Uh, but I also grew up learning how to do mammalogy. I was, a, you know, he was a mammal ecologist. I'm not trapping. I learned how to make study scans. And all of our specimens that we accumulated, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, fish, were deposited in the Florida State Museum. So I, I wanted the same life. And, and so uh, I spent maybe two years in the U.S. as a kid and flew directly from Burma to Baltimore, I've never been north of Florida, and and uh, uh, went to Johns Hopkins thinking that it had a great zoology program, because once upon a time it did, and it turns out it was molecular cell biology. So I get, came out of the biology department, went to the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department, where they were doing ecology and evolution, heavy hitters like Steve Stanley and Jeremy J uh, Jackson and, and, and my advisor, Bob Bacher, the warm-blooded dinosaur guy, were all there doing evolutionary theory. And so that's what I, I did as an undergraduate, but essentially a degree in paleontology, uh, and then wanted to do a doctorate on snake evolution. So I, I knew that the mecca for uh, 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 zoology was the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. I applied to a master's program in tropical public health because my overall plan was to find a way to get back to the tropics and be a zoologist. Uh, and I worked part time at the Museum of Comparative Zoology uh, in the reptile department. Uh, and notice that people, you know, people like Stephen J. Gold were there, and his students were having problems finding jobs after they got their doctorates. And at the same time, I was in, in, you know, a master's student in tropical public health, and I was assigned to a guy named Andy Spielman, who, who was a medical entomologist. And he just started working on this new infection. This is 1984, September of 1984. It was called Lyme disease. And he was writing an NIH grant, and he said, well, you know, I need a mammal ecologist. And I'm like, well, I've done that. Why not? 
And I've been doing Lyme disease ever since because I figured that it was a way that I could continue to be a field biologist and support myself and contribute to public health. And so today, what I want to sort of do is, is summarize what I've done over four years with the, the sad realization that over that time, all we've seen is Lyme disease incidents continue to grow and grow and grow. And it's been particularly disheartening to me because HIV came along at the same time, and we've done fantastic things to reduce the morbidity and mortality for HIV. And we've done nothing for Lyme disease. And it turns out it's the same old story in public health. We know what we need to do, but we just can't get people to do it, right? Smoking cessation, sexually transmitted infections. It's an old story. But it's also a cautionary tale to the younger people here that you can work hard, come up with interventions. And for many reasons, those interventions will never help reduce morbidity and mortality. So, so it's sort of the pale of woe and, and, and uh, 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 a cautionary tale of, of, of you know, doing your hardest and yet not making an impact. So uh, my system that, I've, that I study is the deer tick uh, and uh, a community of pathogens. So the talk is entitled Lyme is focusing on Lyme disease. But it actually also includes the system of agents transmitted by the same tick. So that's uh, Lyme disease. And for those of you who are epidemiologists, the burden, the public health burden is really uh, uh, not that high. It's 200 to 500 cases per 100,000 per year in highly endemic communities. It's way less, maybe 100 times less nationally. Babesiosis is far less in terms of the burden. It's a malaria-like infection. Uh, and uh, uh, the others, human granulocytic ankyrolichiosis or anaplasmosis, uh, Broly miyamotoi disease, a relative of Broly burgdorferi, the Asian Lyme disease, and, and lost encephalitis, or what I call deer tick virus fever, even rarer. But many of the things that I talk about are applicable to the epidemiology and control of these other infections. And it, it sort of begs the question, why do we have this focus on single infections when we know everything does not exist by itself, but also they exist as communities? So you need to know a little bit about the epidemiology of Lyme disease in order to understand intervention, to come up with interventions and understand uh, how to deploy them. Uh, if you look just at uh, the, 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 the date of onset for cases appearing in, in health clinics, uh, each one of them seems to have a peak in June and July, with the exception uh, of uh, Borrelia miyamotoi disease. And if you look at the life cycle of the tick, which was pieced together by people like me, uh, trapping mammals every month from January to December, we finally figured out that we could start in April and, and spare the misery of working in the wintertime, uh, and counting ticks on animals and surveying animals for the, the stages of the tick that are a present during a certain time, you come up with a, a life history diagram where the adult ticks are in the fall and throughout the winter and into the spring, ending about May. Uh, they're looking for large animals such as deer, but they'll feed on dogs, they'll feed on cats, they'll feed on coyotes. Uh, and uh, uh, the adults will take a blood meal and lay eggs. It doesn't matter whether they, lay, they, they took a blood meal uh, in, in October, or they took a blood meal in May, those eggs will have synchronously in mid-July. And the larval ticks emerging from those, those uh, eggs will look for hosts in July, August, September, sometimes into October. Uh, and if they're successful, they're looking for things that are within a couple inches of the ground. And typically that's the small rodents, birds, for example, but you know, you can also see them on deer, which bed down on the ground and thus contact uh, larvae. Uh, if they feed successfully, they will overwinter as engorged ticks and engorged larvae. We don't know where, maybe in mouse burrows or something like that. And then they will start to develop and mold as it warms up in the spring and turn into nymphs. The nymphs will seek hosts uh, starting in May, uh, maybe late, late April, uh, and uh, uh, their peak is in June and, and early July, and then they disappear by mid to late July, depending upon whether uh, drought conditions appear, dryness uh, is a bad thing for these ticks. 
If they feed successfully as nymphs, they will molt within that summer and start looking for hosts as adults uh, that October. So it's at least a two-year life cycle. And I actually think that even though this life cycle was uh, uh, put together in the mid to late 1980s, there may actually still be some things that we don't understand. For example, uh, engorged nymphs in the laboratory have two cohorts. One of them will molt at 21 degrees centigrade within a month. The other ones will take six months to molt. And it tells me that there's some really nice physiological mechanism for buffering ecological uh, catastrophe uh, that these ticks develop. But how to approach that in uh, in ecology is not quite clear. The larvae are born, uh, born uh, in quotation marks, uninfected other than for Borrelia miyamotoi uh, and uh, 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 Powassan virus, which are both, uh, it's possible for them to be inherited. The importance of the life cycle shows you that if you have an onset in June and July, it means that the nymph is the vector stage. You need to identify which of these three stages are responsible for cases, uh, because then, then you can uh, target those stages with interventions. But Miyamoto I uh, has an onset in August, and that would suggest that it's the larva that is infecting people, that is the inherited bacteria are infecting people, and they don't require a reservoir host, and therefore targeting a reservoir host is not useful. Infection rates, uh, they are unusual in that uh, a large proportion of ticks are actually infected. Uh, and this begs the question, why on earth don't we see more infection associated with adult ticks because they're twice as infected? They have two chances of acquiring infection. And the discrepancy is because of human behavior largely. That is, uh, we're dressed very differently in the summer. We have shorts on and sandals and things like that. And ticks have an easy time to get underneath clothing and attach and, and feed. Whereas in the wintertime, we're wearing long trousers and coats. Ticks have a harder time getting up underneath clothing. The other thing is uh, tick size. That's a nymphal ear tick attached to a human skin, uh, the size of a poppy seed. Adult ticks are much bigger. They're maybe a third of the size of an apple seed. And they're much easier to see and find and remove. Prompt removal aborts infection. Uh, and then finally, I, I think there's something to be said about inocula, uh, that the, the, <laughs> the uh, 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 adult tick, uh, uh, the, the nymphal tick, for some reason, is more efficient at delivering the inoculum than the adult tick. And the adult tick has no relevance to the life cycle because it feeds on animals that are not capable physiologically of supporting infection. They, they get infected, they mount an immune response, or they clear infection because of host complements, which the bacteria are, are sensitive to. They're not important for Babesia microbial. There's no way that they, the, the parasite will infect. Uh, and and the, the only infection for which the adult tick might actually uh, serve to, to, to increase the basic reproduction number uh, is, is uh, anaplasma, uh, which uh, uh, will infect deer. Oh, you did something so that's not. <laughs> Just put it back. Oh, yeah. this. Yeah. And then it should be. Ah, there we go. Yeah. So I said a uh, 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 prompt removal modifies the 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 uh, chances that someone will get infected and it's because these the pathogens have developed adaptations to the extended life cycle of the tick remember a larva is feeding in july august september they're molting in april or may that's eight or nine months that something has to persist within the tick which is you know metabolically dormant what happens is that these pathogens go metabolically dormant. They're uninfectious in that stage. Uh, and then when the, the newly molted nymph is, is, is seeking a host, find the host, the, the ambient temperature is different. These things are ectothermic. And so uh, the, the change in temperature between what they encounter on the ground and what is on your skin reactivates the agents. They, they, uh, and that is why we have a certain number of uh, hours to remove a tick before sufficient organisms have activated and become infectious. And all of these uh, events are, are accompanied by really interesting 
uh, molecular mechanisms of regulation of genes and replacement of, of surface proteins and, and the changes uh, in, in terms of tissue tropis. So the Borrelia burgdorferi agent Lyme disease is 24 to 48 hours for this reactivation process to occur. The parasite is the Babesia microti is even more extended because it has to deploy from an undifferentiated spore blast. Uh, and anaplasma seems to, to acquire uh, a, a, an odd ultrastructural feature of a dense core form. Uh, sadly, for things like tick-borne encephalitis virus, they are ready to go in the salivary glands uh, immediately. So that's, that's an important modulator of how many people get infected because you have to let it take feed on you sufficient number of hours in order to get infected. So why is it that the incidence keeps going up and up and up? Uh, and, uh, and if you believe a lot of the stuff that's out there, well, you know, it's because of climate change. Uh, it's not true. Uh, deer density and suburbanization are what are driving changes in the public health burden. We have more homes. This is a GIS analysis of of the period in the mid 2000s when, when we, we took data from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Uh, any, any town that's reporting more than five cases a year is in red. And you can see how quickly the red marches across uh, uh, Eastern Massachusetts. Uh, and at the same time, the Massachusetts Division of Fish and Wildlife published an interesting paper where they, they show where people can effectively manage deer. You cannot discharge a firearm within uh, uh, 500 feet of an inhabited home, and that takes away 18 acres of huntable land. So all of this area in orange is where you cannot effectively hunt with a shotgun. Uh, and I don't think there's any coincidence that this uh, largely matches of uh, where people can and cannot hunt. So there are more deer around more homes uh, and more ticks, and, and this is becoming increasingly difficult to manage. There are more people, way more people now, and they're exposed to low prevalence pathogens. More people, even in the face of a constant, you know, 0.1% prevalence means that you're still gonna have more cases. Uh, and our demographics are changing. At least two of these infections, anaplasma and babesia, I guess also tick-borne uh, encephalitis, uh, blossom virus, are more severe in people who are older than 60 years old. And our demographics have changed. We have baby boomers now coming up and being more uh, a, a larger proportion of the population. And so we're seeing more symptomatic cases. We're seeing more cases than even no compromised people. People are living longer under uh, the chemotherapeutics for malignancy, for example, or with HIV. So these are the things that are really driving uh, 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 increasing incidence. Most people don't realize just how much change there is in the land. I was horrified to see that we're losing uh, 10 acres a day in Massachusetts uh, due to development. And this is actually a de decrease from uh, the uh, 2010 or so, when we were losing 40 acres a day due to development. And when you say development, it means someone goes in and chops down our, our reforested areas, and we have successional growth around these housing developments, and that promotes the kind of fauna that you need to, to promote a uh, Lyme disease. I've studied Nantucket Island since 1985, uh, uh, and, and babesiosis is actually a great infection to study because the diagnosis is unequivocal. You have a blood smear positive, uh, and I used to receive all the blood smears from the Nantucket Cottage Hospital to confirm that they were indeed infected. Uh, and so a lot of these, uh, this data I collected uh, over the course of, of, of uh, uh, since 1985, and then sadly, uh, everything, started being sent out to a company that did PCR. So you can't really compare the numbers here with the numbers here, but nonetheless, it's clear that you're not really seeing an increase in incidence on a place like Nantucket Island, which saw the index case of babesiosis in 1969 and was one of the first sites where Lyme disease first emerged. But the point is that the population has increased dramatically. So the, that, the number of cases, it appears as if it's doubled or tripled since the 1970s. It could be attributed solely to the fact that the population has increased dramatically and development has increased dramatically. These are uh, satellite photos of an area on Nantucket in 1975 
And in 1993, you see the, the sheer number of roads and, and cleared spaces for houses at that time. It's not due to more tourism. The tourism has been flat. The number of people visiting on the, the boat that you need to take uh, over from Cape Cod. And so uh, 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 the, the development even is taking place even in, in, in even though we have a uh, tremendous protection of 40% of the land on Nantucket from development. Has the risk actually changed? And if you look at serological studies done by the CDC in, in their investigations of so-called Nantucket fever that are during the 1970s, they came up with about 3% uh, 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 prevalence uh, of antibody. And 10 years later, uh, 20 years later, we were able to show that it was about 4.3%. Uh, but the confidence intervals overlap. There's really no evidence serologically in terms of serial prevalence that the infection has changed in terms of uh, uh, risk. Uh, entomological indices, well, early on we were using microscopy to detect this, and the early uh, reports showed great prevalence of something like, you know, 20 to 40 percent infected ticks. Well, we were looking at things within the salivary glands of the ticks. We dissect out salivary glands and stain them with a fulgin reaction, and look for these inclusions in between the, the, the athener cells, the athener nuclei of the salivary glands. And it turns out there are two different babesias in these ticks. One is a commensal uh, or a parasite of deer that has no bearing whatever on human disease, and it has a very small circumscribed sporoblast, and then babesia microti is actually uh, more diffuse. And if you go back and reread all the slides, the actual uh, median uh, infection rate for, for 10 years or so is 13%. And by PCR, we see it's about 10% in more recent observations. And I do a lot of trapping. I've done uh, 20 years or more of longitudinal trapping, capture mark release trapping of small mammals on, on Nantucket. And, and if you look at the ticks infecting mice, the mice are indexed uh, out of the, the tick population, you can see that there really is no trend, upward trend. So there are places where these infections have reached equilibrium and any, any increase that we see, we don't see it here, but any increase that we see could be attributable to population change. So that's epidemiology in a nutshell for Lyme disease and the other infections that the deer tick transmits. You, so the devised interventions, it, it should be important. It's important for everybody to be on the same page about what the goal of the intervention is. And so, and, and there are short-term modes uh, where resources and attention are needed every day or forever more. And, and in order to get people to, to have that commitment of doing it every day, uh, you need to see results very quickly. And these are things such as personal protection or household or community. Uh, and these are things such as uh, repellents or spraying the yard or, or actually vaccination that requires boosting. But we like to look at the long term in public health. The, 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 the change in risk over time is much more interesting to us. Uh, and, and so after a period of lots of resources, we only need a maintenance phase. We see risk reduction over time. The scale is much larger over the area, and there are things like that are gear reduction, the vaccination. I, I, I won't belabor this. There are many ways you can protect yourself. The best of all are these permethrin treated clothing items. Uh, the chemical is impregnated into the fabric. Our military uniforms have been treated for 24, and they, our soldiers are in them 24 7 for the last 20 years. The compound is the treatment of choice for treatment of head lice in children at a concentration that is way more than what is on the, 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 the fabric itself. And so it's a very, very safe thing to do. And, and it's now what I use. I used to avoid infection by simply uh, tucking my uh, cuffs into my socks and wearing long sleeves and doing a tip check. I'm sadly much older now, I'm, I'm 62. And if I got any of these infections, I'd probably have a harder time of it. So I have started to use permethrin, even though I was sort of like this for the longest time because I want my ticks alive. And this stuff, permethrin, is just death on ticks. They die within three hours of getting anywhere near permethrin. So it's a conception I have made. Uh, uh, so if, if I have anything that I, I, I had a long-term focus, 
It is, is what I call anti autoimmunity. Uh, if you look at uh, a Lyme disease spirochete, this is a cross section, so the long ends are going in and out of the screen. There's a there's a, a layer of membrane protein on the outside, and the major constituent of constituent of that is a lipoprotein OSPA, outer surface protein A, and it is immunodominant. Uh, and and uh, uh, as a postdoc, we, we received word that uh, some, some people at Yale had developed a vaccine against Lyme disease. And this is an interesting story for young people. My colleague, Daryl Pickering at Yale, uh, he got his MD from Cornell, and he said, I want to do some research. And he got a fellowship and was attached to the lab of Rich Favell at, at Yale, who's a huge, high powered immunologist. And he goes, Well, you know, why don't you make a, a vaccine against Lyme disease? It's in our backyard, maybe it will be useful. Errol had never done a scientific experiment in his life, but the sequence for Ospe had just been published. He made PCR primers, took cultured material, amplified out the Ospe gene, cloned it into uh, a, a readily available kit, a GSD fusion protein uh, recombinant uh, kit. I uh, purified the protein, uh, uh, immunized mice, and got a science paper out of it because he protected them. And all of his fellow uh, workers hated his guts because it was his first experiment and gets a science paper. And we, we see this in, in the New York Times. We go, well, you know, and we were asked for confidence. So like, well, you know, they used a, a, a hypodermic syringe to challenge their vaccinated mice. But we know that this is a vector-borne infection and the salivary proteins actually promote infection at the site of inoculation. They're immunosuppressive uh, and anti-hemostatic. Uh, and anti-inflammatory compounds that are being delivered into the site of the fight. So if you challenged your mice with ticks, this vaccine wouldn't work. And down at Yale, I understand here, Errol said, what's a tick? Uh, but, uh, uh, but to his credit, he called me up and he said, bring them down. And we did the experiment. I went down, I placed the ticks on his mice. I had no idea which mice I were putting them, putting them on. And he mailed me back all the engorged ticks. You put them on the mice, you put the cages in a pan of water, the ticks crawl out after they've done feeding, you can harvest them. And then you check them for evidence of infection. I had already checked them before putting them on, you know, batches. And this was a really good batch. It was like 80, 90% infection rate. And I get these ticks back and I'm detecting them and going, how did I screw up? Only half the ticks are infected. And it, it dawned on both of us, you know, this is what we were seeing. You clusters of spirochetes in half of them, and then these blobs of antigen in others. And we both came to the realization this is happening because of this reactivation phenomenon that antibody from vaccination is coming into the tick and destroying the Lyme disease spirochetes before they had a chance to change their surface coat, get out of the gut, and be transmitted. So it's a unique mode of action for the life for a vaccine. It did not depend on an anamnestic response, but rather circulating antibody. Uh, and uh, uh, I was interested in how, whether this actually was happening in nature and could account for the, the fact that some animals were reservoirs and some animals were not. That is, it was all due to anti antibody uh, and, and did some simple experiments like passive transfer of antibody and showed that they lose their the mice that are infected lose their capacity to infect ticks once they get heterologous back, uh, immune serum. And if it's heterologous, it disappears within a week and you can put ticks back on. And, and it shows that, that uh, there was a tremendous decrease in the number of infected ticks coming out after passive transfer and a recovery of that when, when antibody disappeared. So it was a very unique mode of action. Uh, and we all said, well, you know, Lyme disease doesn't approach any kind of public health significance, really, it only infects a few rich people. Uh, but maybe we can do something interesting like orally immunize uh, mice with the vaccine. You can take recombinant uh, uh, bacteria and feed them in a bait. We put in a, a, a invention disclosure to Harvard and to Yale and, and outlined the, the way we would do this. Uh, and Harvard and Yale look at it and go, we, won't, we wouldn't even recover the cost of filing a patent, no. Uh, and, and the reason this is ironic, oh, uh, let me go back to this though. We, we never thought anybody was interested in Lyme disease. And then we get a call from Smith Beach Beecham, one of the largest 
uh, 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 pharma companies in the world, they had actually developed a Lyme disease vaccine in Germany uh, and were looking for uh, clinical test sites. And they asked us at Harvard, because we had these wonderful study sites on the New England islands, can you do a phase two study for us? And so that was my postdoc, was actually for two years running the phase two smith Klein beach a clinical vaccine trial, and I did things like make up posters and put them in the liquor stores, and, and, and all of this was done by mail. We recruited by mail, uh, and, and I, I was able to present this as first author, but then they were interested in going to phase three. They wouldn't give me the actual data from the phase two, and Harvard said, no, you're not publishing without seeing the actual data, and so I didn't get a publication out of this. Uh, even though it was one of the most interesting projects I've ever been involved in. So, so, so there were pressures from internally at the company not to release any information about the trial until well after they had received permission from the FDA to conduct a phase three clinical trial. And, and I'd like to point out Lyme disease, the human Lyme disease vaccine was approved. They went with Mr. Lyme disease himself, Alan Steer, who discovered Lyme disease in coastal Connecticut. Uh, he ran the phase three trial, uh, 6,000 people up and down uh, the New England coast. Uh, and it was approved by the FDA. Uh, and the, the trial showed that the vaccine efficacy was uh, 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 23 to 63% after the first a uh, year of vaccination and after a boost, 53 to 78. And a lot of people look at those numbers and they say, well, why bother when it's really just a crouch? I mean, you get vaccinated and your chance of reducing your risk of infection is only 50%. And I'm like, that's the wrong way to look at a vaccine. In public health, if you reduce the burden of infection by 50% over two to 10 years, that's a tremendous public health achievement. So that's the way to look at some vaccines. It's not immediate individual protection, but rather over populations over time. So this is the only intervention proven to reduce the incidence of Lyme disease. We don't have it anymore. There were issues with it. You needed uh, three initial doses. You need an annual boost. Uh, uh, it didn't protect the other taking uh, transmitted infection, so you still needed to protect yourself from sick by This was the big one. It was an elective vaccine. Insurance didn't cover the cost. You couldn't vaccinate children. There are all sorts of other things. That there was tremendous activism by the Lyme disease advocacy groups, uh, and it was thus withdrawn by sick by region because they actually was they weren't making any money on this. Lyme disease was so restricted in geography. Uh, and, 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 and population. And nobody touched the subject of a human Lyme disease vaccine for almost 20 years. And in the interim, I got fed up. I was thinking of forming a nonprofit to revive Lyme rates and, and deliver it, you know, just get it made in India and have it delivered by friendly physicians on a cost of uh, pay what you can model. Uh, and, and but then Pfizer came along, and they they decided they were going to advance a, a product, uh, and they're now a huge marketing uh, uh, strategy going on as they're doing their phase three trial, uh, and I think it's very likely that it will uh, be approved by 2026, and it's uh, essentially identical to the Smith Klein vaccine. It's just that now there's a tremendous market for it, and the biggest market is. Mothers who are angry and tired of checking their children every day for ticks. That's what's going to make it succeed. So I was even in, during this time, <laughs> the people I talked to said, well, you know, we can't get venture capital. We can't get philanthropy for this. We can't get venture capital because you're not a businessman and you don't know how to spend money. I, I was so angry that I was going to put the formula online for making this vaccine for DIY bio people. There are people out there who are fed up with pharma. They're making recombinant insulin in their basements. There's no reason they can't make this vaccine. It's a simple E. coli recombinant protein. It's easy to purify. You just have to worry about endotoxin. No, seriously, I, I think this is where, you know, things are gonna move if, uh, if we need to. So, uh, integrated tick management is one of the things we talk about, you know, a, a number of different things done at the same time in communities, 
can manage brush, you can educate, you can spray. Spray is not a dirty word anymore. There are what we call host targeted the parasites, permethrin or fipronil or something on cotton that mice take back to their nests, on, on deer feeders that roll, you know, with the deer paint themselves with. Uh, and, and so I like to think of long-term solutions and there are two major factors that we need to be thinking about producing the ticks, and that's tick reproduction. We can target that. And infection of the tick, the uninfected larvae need to get infected. And so I'm gonna focus now on deer reduction and a newer strategy, uh, genetically modifying the reservoir host. For the longest time, our, our lab at Harvard, sadly, uh, were the major promoters of this idea that white-footed mice were the main reservoir host for the Asian Lyme disease. This is not quite true. And in fact, Uriel Catron was one of the first uh, people to say that this was not true. After He was a Tacony fellow at Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, when I was a graduate student, he was working on a, 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 a review of the anti-malaria control in the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, and, and hung out with uh, uh, Andy Spielman in our lab uh, and moved on to a faculty position in Illinois and started looking at Lyme disease ecology and fingered chipmunks as being uh, potentially influential in the life cycle of Lyme disease. But nonetheless, a lot of papers came out. You have people from the uh, Curie Institute claiming that mice should have been all and be all, yet in the same breath, uh, the same co person uh, being co-authors on papers that say contrary uh, to, to pervasive thinking, the white-footed mouse is not the primary reservoir. So, but nonetheless, everybody is focused on uh, white-footed mice, even us, uh, you know, at Tufts, we, we were developing uh, vaccines to be delivered in bait, in bait boxes. You could de determine which mice had taken bait by looking at rhodamine the staining of whiskers. They ingest bait with rhodamine and the whiskers fluoresce under UV light. It was gonna be a strategy very similar to vaccine uh, virus uh, uh, rabies vaccines. Uh, and uh, uh, the problem was in order to get regulatory approval from USDA to use this in a larger field trial, we needed to make sure that our master seed virus stocks did not contain any other adventitious organisms. And so we tried to clear vaccinia from our lines, from our cell lines and couldn't kill the virus enough to see whether there was anything else. They wouldn't accept metagenomics as proof that there was nothing else in there. It had to be done the old way by looking for cytopathic effect in cell lines. So we gave that up. Uh, there is proof of concept that vaccination would uh, reduce the prevalence of infection in ticks. Gene Sal did this for a doctoral work and showed that if you immunize mice uh, artificially by injecting them as they trap them, that uh, uh, you get 30% fewer ticks by vaccination. Uh, and so that's sort of a variant of delivering a, a vaccine virus. And now US Biologics has USDA approval to sell a oral vaccine delivered in these little mouse houses that you distribute out in the woods. Uh, and they claim that orally immunizing mice with dead E. coli expressing recombinant OSPE is sufficient to uh, induce enough of an antibody tiger to inhibit transmission. We're, 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 we have another approach using baits. Uh, hypomycin A is an a, a antibiotic recently discovered by Ken Lewis at Northeastern University. It's selected for Borrelia It doesn't seem to kill a lot of other my, microbial agents. Uh, and the idea was, well, if you're not gonna use it clinically, which would take a long time to get approved, uh, including you'd have to do phase one, two, and three uh, clinical trials. So we've got bait boxes out there. I'm running four grids, two with control, two with, with baits. And the vagaries of be being an ecologist. Uh, last year was the rainiest summer on record for 20 years. And what was happening is our baits were getting moldy. And so I'm really down on bait delivered vaccines or drugs now. And there are other issues like, you know, these are camera traps. You can see a white-footed mouse here in the bait boxes. We made these fancy bait boxes to prevent anybody from fiddling with the baits. Uh, and and you should have clever little animals like weasels sitting there in front of the box waiting for mice to come out. And in fact, the fecal material from the, the weasels have more drug in them than the mice 
feces do. So this is really not a, a, a great approach, but nonetheless, we actually have NIH funding to do this, and I have to carry the experiments out. So what can we do for the long term? Uh, these are the main drivers for, you know, this is where it came from. We, we cut down the forest, we let them reforest, we get, we get reforestation. We're now back at, you know, pretty mature deciduous forests in, in New England. Uh, but successional habitat is, is important. This was what with the landscape looked like. It was pasture, and 80 years later, it was grown up so to be so impenetrable. But imagine, where are the deer going to be here? Where are the mice going to be here? In fact, the, the fauna has changed. The dominant small mammal was the meadow bull, which is a diurnal grassland animal. And now the dominant small mammal is the white-footed mice. We already talked about deer being the main reproductive host. And then, of course, all of these sites have a lot of development. Well, of these three main drivers, what can we realistically expect to actually alter? We can't tell people, no, you can't develop your land and build your houses. We can't tell you not to go hiking. We can't seriously say, we're going to go down and chop the forest down again. But we can attack the deer. Deer feed most adult deer ticks, the early studies. In fact, these are hard studies to do, so there aren't any others like this. But each deer tick female that engorges will lay 2,000 larvae. I personally picked 99 engorged female deer ticks from one deer. You don't have to be a mathematician to realize how many ticks can be produced by one deer. And, and part of my doctoral work was the Great Island Experiment, where the, a small peninsula off of Cape Cod, uh, owned by some wealthy people, uh, who said, enough is enough. 16% of the population had gotten Lyme disease by 1981, uh, and they said, do something. And Andy Spielman uh, 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 proposed this experiment where we would go in and reduce the deer herd and follow it out over time to see what happened. And, and again, you don't need mathematics. The number of uh, larvae that were present on mice using the mice as unbiased samplers because they go where we cannot go. Uh, uh, and then the control site on Nantucket Island where there is no such a uh, uh, reduction of deer herds, and the, the both nymphs and, and larvae diminished, and the number of deer were, we, we had a sharp tutor come in and remove both of them, and the caretaker uh, every year would, would, would remove enough, keep them uh, at fewer than 10 per a square mile, and then I would go in and bleed people starting in 1985 and continuing until 1994. Twice a year, they would sit, they, they have a chapel in the woods, and I would sit there at a table and they would stick their arm out and I'd bleed them and we would prospectively look for cases that way. And, and there were very few cases after deer reduction. So to me, deer reduction works. Uh, models suggest that deer reduction may work but may not diminish the prevalence of infection in nature. And that's all right, as long as people aren't getting infected. But in fact, if you look at the data, we've, we've looked at sort of conversion in mice on Great Island, and the, uh, the rate of sort of conversion on Great Island is far less than that on Nantucket Island. The prevalence of infection in mice is, is a lot more difficult to measure because Lyme disease bacteria are not found in the blood, but we can look at Babesia microti, and there seems to be a little difference, but what's even more convincing to me is rarefaction analysis of genotypes of Babesia microti in, in the ticks. Uh, and uh, uh, it's clear that the, the number of variants that we see, genetic diversity that we see in the parasite population, has been greatly diminished right after uh, intervention and then following it out uh, 10 years after deer reduction, whereas it only goes up and up and up out on Nantucket Island. The diversity is being maintained genetically on Nantucket where we don't reduce deer, but as a call, as a result of deer reduction, uh, genetic diversity is, is diminished. And our objective of deer reduction is not eradication, but rather pushing them back into smaller and smaller sites. If we have tons of deer, they're, they're occupying more and more of a home range, a more of a forage range. Uh, and and uh, after an intervention, we want to push them down into little sites and have less interaction uh, of, of them dropping ticks in people's yards. As it is across the landscape, there are only certain areas where they tend to concentrate. The black areas are where the deer are hanging out, according to infrared flyovers of, of, of the island. 
And so we should be able to go in and reduce deer, but nonetheless, we can't do that. So where are we, so there's a tremendous backlash against hunt against taking deer. Fish and Wildlife won't let us do it because they say deer is a resource of all the citizens of Massachusetts, and we need to steward their, their safety and availability to all, all residents. Uh, and, and the Humane Society, of course, comes in and trots out people uh, like, uh, we won't say names, but people who should know better saying, oh, deer have nothing to do with Lyme disease. Uh, and and uh, uh, hunters themselves go, oh no, we don't want to take more deer because we'll have to work harder to get our deer. So they were aligning themselves with the Humane Society. <laughs> so I, I've pretty much given up trying to get people to kill deer. Yet another one of those things. We know what we need to do, but we just can't get people to do it. So when Kevin Estall, he was a, a postdoc with George Church at, at Harvard Medical School and, and developed some key refinements of, of CRISPR, uh, he became a faculty member at MIT in the media lab of all places. And he and his wife were sick of, of, of checking their children for ticks in Newton, Massachusetts, it's a suburb of Boston. And he came to me and he said, well, you know, why can't we genetically modify mice so that they're resistant to infection? And I'm like, this is the first new idea in intervention against Lyme disease that I've heard. Of course, I'm on board, and we decide we'll take the age-old, well-known, well-validated system of anti-ospate antibody. So this, you know, this is like 30, almost 30 years after I first worked on anti-ospate antibody, and what we're doing is to try to uh, heritably immunized mice, that is, uh, have the genome altered so that they are uh, uh, from birth expressing constitutively antibody to off -bay. And that will make them resistant to being infected. And not only that, if they there is breakthrough infection, they would not be able to pass infection on to new ticks. And so uh, they call the project Mice Against Ticks. The, the general scheme is here. That we're, we're expressing anti antibody and hepatocytes of all things. Uh, and, and sadly, white-footed mice are distantly related to mus musculus, the laboratory mice. They're much more closely related to hamsters. We, we, I thought this was going to be a slam dunk. We do MIT people. We've got the best transgenic people in the world there. We should have a, a transgenic mice in two years. And then it becomes my problem, which is, finding small release sites, getting regulatory approval, and things like that for a field trial. Turns out they had a hard time getting transgenesis and permanence because they had, we have no way of actually determining when they ovulate. With white mice, you can take a smear, a vaginal smear, and look at the cytology and say, oh, they're ovulating. With these things, they had to invent an AI-driven infrared camera on cages that would tell them when the, you know, when the mice had a, a rise in temperature and, and activity, characteristic activity. And now we can find out exactly when ovulation is occurring. They can harvest oocytes, they can manipulate them and, and culture the embryonic stem cell and introduce the gene. And, and in fact, uh, we, we have a, a, a quiz at Harvard Medical School making recombinant anti ospate antibody gene on, on paramyscus immunoglobulin backbones. And these are all really, really good. I've identified small field sites for field release, less than a square mile in area. In case something goes wrong, I can go on and nuke things. Uh, but uh, uh, we have yet to get paramyscus expressing anti ospate antibody genes. Uh, uh, but we have proof of concept with mus musculus doing the same thing. They're born, they're expressing anti ospate antibody, and they are resistant to infection by tick challenge. So the proof of concept is there, and it's only a matter of time. But the nice thing about this experiment is that Kevin is very, very concerned about the, the responsible use of technology. Uh, and uh, he has, from the start, incorporated the, the communities on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard to inform them every step of the way. This is what we want to do. This is how we're going to proceed. When we get a mouse, we'll come to you and we'll say, do you want this in your community? Because it's an irreversible change to the environment. So it's community informed consent. And so, you know, this is public health at its best. It's, it's 
involving the community, getting their buy-in from the very start. And I think the clever thing, because I don't see Lyme disease as being consequential enough to go this far, especially because there's plenty of Lyme disease vaccine, the interest in doing this is gonna diminish. However, the most important part of this is that it has applications to global health. We can attack loss of fever, we can attack bulimia and hemorrhagic fever, leptospirosis, other things that are global public health issues and have rodent reservoirs with the same technology. So if you have genetically modified mosquitoes, you'll have genetically modified mice. A lot of people come up to me and say, well, but, but you're playing God. And I'm like, you know, humans have been playing God for hundreds and hundreds of years. You have a dog. What kind of dog is it? Did it exist 200 years ago? No, because we selected for it. We're just accelerating artificial selection by doing genetic modification. So this is a new idea, a new idea potentially with a global public health uh, applications. However, one of our oral ones on, is on tank ecology. And we, we, we're revisiting this idea of the contribution of white footed mice to infecting ticks. And the breakthrough was my wife has the same degrees that I do from the same lab. We've been working together for over 20 years. She's a molecular biologist, a molecular epidemiologist. She developed a way of looking at the forensic technologies and using retrotransposons, host specific retrotransposons and detecting those in host seeking ticks to figure out what they had fed on in the previous instar that gave them the infection. It turns out the this it's spatially, temporally variable, uh, uh, and, and over over the course of years, uh, the proportion of animals getting infection from mice differs, and shrews, interestingly, turn out to be even more influential. And so, so we've decided that, well, you know, it, it, it's, they're not universal reservoirs. Does this mean that uh, our fancy genetically modified mice uh, are worthless? No, because they do indeed uh, contribute to infection. And modeling could tell us, you know, if you use it as part of integrated ticket management, maybe we can reduce the mouse contribution to, to the force of transmission, and it has cumulative effects on transmission. So you're, you're impacting the basic reproduction number over time. Again, it's a public health perspective. You're not seeing effects now, but maybe 10 years from now, we will. So again, this is really like the most, these are the most exciting things that I've been doing over 40 years now with all this new technology. But you know, uh, uh, we've been very generously supported by NIH over the years. Uh, I, I completely owe my career to NIH, uh, and uh, there are a number of people who, who, who uh, I currently work with, without whom none of this work would happen, uh, and, and obviously my wife, and my, I'm trying to get my kids interested in all of this, and I take them on trapping uh, 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 trips to the islands, we're here in a motel, uh, 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 working up mice that I trap, uh, we're flagging our, our cool linear research site, but no, neither of them seem to be interested in, in being a disease ecologist, sad, sad to say. But nonetheless, uh, uh, this has allowed me to, to try to uh, 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 foster STEM in my children by, in the same way that, that it was fostered uh, into me. So with that, I am happy to, you know, I started in 1985 and I'm still, every summer I am doing field work because this is such an interesting and complicated public health system. I can be doing population genetics on one day and community engagement on another and, and tick ecology on another day. It is just, and it is truly across scales. <laughs> That's a great note to end on. Thank yeah. you. <laughs>